Hello, uh, my name is uh, Vega Bergoy. Uh, I work for the Directorate of Cultural Heritage in Norway, as Hegel said. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, um, I'm here to present uh, the results from a new report that was recently made uh, by Menom Economics and it was uh, commissioned by our directorate. Um, yeah, we all know that cultural heritage has a value uh, in economic terms, but we do not uh, necessarily have the numbers to back up that claim. So uh, this study aims to do something about that. Um, now, I'm not an economist myself, and I'm not, I have not worked with this report, so if there are any complicated economic questions, I will have to refer to my colleagues. Um, but we do have an English summary uh, of this report that we will make uh, available to you. Yeah. So, um, the purpose of the project is to um, present different parts uh, of the total economic benefits of cultural heritage and uh, cultural environments and uh, to increase our knowledge based on empirical studies. So what are people willing to pay for cultural heritage in the real market and what is the economic impact from cultural heritage? Um, yeah conservation and uh, use of cultural heritage do contribute to social welfare and here social welfare is defined as net benefit and we seek to illustrate with examples the benefit that individuals and businesses get from cultural heritage uh, in Norway today. Um, yeah, and uh, a socio-economic analysis is a tool to identify and highlight all effects of a policy or a measure for affected groups in society. And um, if the population's willingness to pay for a policy is larger than its total costs, we say that the measure is economically profitable. And um, that is interesting if we look at listed properties, because there are some disadvantages of owning a listed property as well. You can't do whatever you want with the doors, the windows, etc. So it is kind of an open question if it has a positive effect or a negative effect on the price. But that's what this um, study looks at. Here's an overview of um, the total economic value from cultural heritage. We have uh, use values and non-use values. The use values can be divided into direct use, which is visiting cultural heritage and staying there and so on and we have indirect use values uh, which is more about uh, the value generated from activities due to cultural heritage such as tourism and then there is the option value the value of our cultural heritage in the future the non-use values um, are related to the contentment we get from knowing that the cultural heritage exists, contentment with knowing that others can use it and that future generations will also have access to it. Um, for example, I like to know that the Coronian spit is there. Uh, I might never go back there, but I like to tell people to go there and uh, I like that it's been being taken care of. It gives me some pleasure, even though I might never go back there. Um, so, to the cases, uh, in this report there are actually four uh, separate studies. Um, two of them are on how much people are willing to pay to live in or close to cultural heritage in uh, Oslo and in the old town of Fredrikstad. Uh, and those are kind of the direct use values. Um, and there are two studies on the economic benefits from cultural heritage tourism. And that's from way up in the north, Henningsberg, uh, and uh, from yeah, the middle of the country, Rörus. And I will, I will mostly focus on the first two. Yeah. Yeah. 
So first, Oslo uh, and the value of living in a listed property uh, or in an area with a lot of other listed properties. Um, this is Oslo and uh, the darker areas here are um, whoop, um, the ones with more listed properties, with more cultural heritage and those are the more central parts of Oslo. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we think that the listed properties in these neighborhoods are comparable to non-listed properties in the same neighborhood. Um, so that is what they have done in the study. Um, and the method they have used is the so-called hedonic pricing method. Um, this is a re so-called revealed preference method. Uh, and it has the advantage that it is based on people's actual behavior in a market that is related to the public good, namely the actual housing market in this case. And um, by identifying and collecting data on as many as possible of the characteristics of the property which may affect the price um, and then carry, <coughs> carry out the regression analysis. Uh, you can discover each of the characteristics uh, contribution to the sales price. Yeah, so this is the question. How much are people willing to pay to live in a listed property? And yeah, different characteristics. And this is the one we're after. So there are two main uh, hypotheses. Um, first, listed properties have a higher value in the market compared to homes that are not listed. And also that there is a higher willingness to pay for living in areas with a high density of cultural heritage. And the results are that there is a willingness to live in a listed home in Oslo. We find that uh, listed properties have an increased value of between 2.3 and 2.4 percent. So. Um, if the market value of a listed property is uh, 525,000 euros, uh, around 12,000 euros can be assigned to its cultural heritage qualities. So that means that in general people are, people are willing to pay 12,000 euros to live in a listed property. Well, <laughs> if it costs that much, of course. Um, and to the other hypothesis, there is an even higher willingness to pay for living in areas where there are other properties or a lot of cultural heritage. Um, and this effect is on average 4 to 5 percent. So it's uh, higher than, uh, than for living in a building that is listed itself. So that was Oslo. Um, next example is the old town in Fredrikstad. You can see it there. It is a fortified Renaissance town, uh, quite well preserved and centrally located in the, in the east of Norway, uh, maybe one and a half hours south of Oslo. And uh, again, two main hypotheses. Uh, there is a higher willingness to pay for living in a cultural environment than for living in comparable homes that are not in a cultural environment. And the cultural environment in this case is the old town that we saw. And the other hypothesis is that there is a willingness to pay for living close to this cultural environment. And um, the results are um, very positive. We find a quite high willingness to pay for living inside the old town in Fredrikstad. Uh, and the value is between 17 and 22% of the property value. 
And furthermore, we find a value of between 14 and 18 percent of living in areas that are close to this um, cultural heritage environment. So these are really high numbers. Um, and uh, yeah, I should also mention that I'm not sure it used to be that way. This is a part of Fredrikstad that has been uh, renovated in, in recent years. I don't, I'm not really good with the history, but it, did not, it was not that popular before, but now it's extremely popular. Um, and then I'll say something about the economic impact of cultural heritage tourism. Um, yeah, the question is um, how it contributes in terms of uh, economic impact and employment in a local society. And we have, yeah, this, uh, I was not able to translate this one, it's an image, but it basically says that um, um, yeah, cultural heritage and cultural environments attract visitors from home and abroad, and uh, the visitors buy goods and services, and this gives an economic impact and it creates employment. So, first example is from Henningsvær up in the north. It's a small uh, fishing town, and uh, the nature there is also very beautiful. Um, Yeah, and uh, the study finds that uh, cultural heritage tourists contribute with around 15% of the total economic impact in Henningsvær and around 20% of the employment. So again, quite nice numbers. And then uh, Rörus. Uh, in the middle of Norway. This is uh, an old uh, mining town um, in a mountainous region, so also there <coughs> quite a lot of uh, nature that people like to use. And this is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. None of the others are UNESCO sites. Um, and the economic impact here, um, actually I'm sorry about this, it's supposed to be 4% of the total economic impact in Rödos uh, is from uh, cult cultural heritage tourists, uh, which is, well, s surprisingly low for us, but it means that they have other industries to uh, live from as well. Um, but the interesting point here is that um, cultural heritage uh, Tourists, they seek quite uh, work-intensive services, so the percentage of the local employment is much higher than the economic impact. So, yeah, there's supposed to be a difference here. There, four <laughs> percent is the economic impact, and nine percent is the total number of employees. So, one in ten of the workers there, they work uh, in the cultural heritage tourism industry. And before I finish, I, I will also uh, mention another um, study that was done uh, recently. Um, it's about uh, a grant scheme we have in Norway. It's a kind of the, the national grant scheme for private uh, owners of uh, cultural heritage. Um, and the analysis uh, shows that uh, the grants that are given, they uh, trigger a sub substantial private, private investment. And this relates to, uh, <coughs> to what we <laughs> just heard. Um, and this private investment is quite big. Um, this uh, grant scheme started in 2003 and uh, until now uh, 60 million euros have, have been given out. Um, and this has triggered a private investment of almost 210 million euros. Um, yeah, so that means that uh, one euro from, uh, from a grant scheme leads to 3.5 euros uh, spent uh, by the private owners. So that's a, those are significant numbers and it shows that this is a quite successful grant scheme. So th these are important numbers to have for us. Uh, when we are talking to policymakers, we can definitely argue that this is a 
uh, an effective grant scheme. So, to sum up, um, there is a willingness to pay for living in cultural heritage homes um, and also to live in areas that are influenced by cultural heritage. Um, and this has now been well, proven, at least for Norway, for those sites that were studied. And, um, and also, based on visitor statistics and spending information and traveling motivation, we can uh, say that uh, cultural heritage tourism contributes with 40 to 50 percent of added value in, in tourism. That means that there are other kinds of tourism as well, and, and in those two places that were studied here, there are quite a lot of um, tourists that come mainly for the nature, they come for skiing, etc. Um, and between 4 and 15 percent of uh, the economic impact that comes from cultural heritage tourism. These are the numbers, and we will, uh, so <laughs> in some way, we uh, give you this uh, summary in English so that you'll be able to look at this more closely yourself. Yeah. Thank you.